Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome, welcome. Um, we have a few challenging technical issues today, so hopefully, uh, well, hopefully it'll go smoothly, but uh, just in case there are any issues, I apologise in advance. Uh, so, my name is Michelle Grayson. I am a senior editor at Outlooks, Nature Outlooks, and these are supplements to Nature magazine. Started in 2010. We've done 92 outlooks in that time from bees, biofuels, biomaterials, and breast cancer. But what qualifies me to be your moderator today is oops, this outlook that I did in 2012, which was supported by our partners today, Ajinomoto, on taste. It's still available online if you want to look at it. And I confess, when I started this outlook, I didn't know a whole lot about taste. I wasn't sure what I'd write about. So I thought back to my school days, and this is what I could remember, that there are four basic tastes, largely uh, determined by Aristotle. And that, uh, does anybody recognize this from their school days, the tongue map? Well, it turns out during my research that Aristotle was only partially correct and, well, the tongue map is just plain wrong. Uh, the missing taste, of course, is umami. So we have sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and umami, which we'll hear a lot more about today. And uh, the tongue map, well, that has been debunked for well over 100 years. We can taste all the tastes across all areas of the tongue. And in the course of doing research, I came up with some more interesting facts I thought I'd share with you today, just to sort of set the scene. Uh, did you know that the taste receptors are spread out all over the body, not just in the tongue? They're in the nose, in the throat, stomach, intestines. They are basically just sensors for sensing anything important, any important chemicals in the environment. But the most surprising place that they can be found is on the head of sperm, which led me to believe that maybe my eggs tasted of umami. <laughs> Taste is affected by smell as well, but there are two ways to smell. We have the uh, orthonasal, where we smell if you just sniff something. There's also retronasal, which is at the back of the throat. And then that means that things can taste very different to the way they smell. And it's thanks to the retronasal smelling that something that smells of stinky socks can actually taste very delicious. And, uh, but not everybody in the animal kingdom has the same sense of taste. Did you know, for example, that cats cannot taste sweet? Did you know also that pandas cannot taste umami? possibly because of their bamboo-only diet, not very rich in amino acids. And the super tasters of the animal world, you might be surprised to hear, the goldfish. Very poor vision, covered in taste buds. So I hope you guys will all learn something today. Uh, we have a great lineup for you, and we're going to take you on a journey. So the journey starts on the tongue. And uh, here are all our taste receptors. Uh, which were discovered, in fact, or co-discovered by one of our speakers today, Nicholas Reber. Nick will then take us up into the brain and show us how these tastes are represented neurologically. Now, we're going to stay in the brain for the second speaker, Catherine Ola, and she's going to tell us how all the tastes are combined with other senses, with uh, vision, with hearing, uh, as well as our memories and emotions to create the bigger picture of flavour and culinary experiences. Now, Katrine couldn't be here today. She nearly landed yesterday, uh, but the snow sadly prevented it. Uh, so we do have her via video link. This is one of the technical issues I was referring to earlier. So, once we have our idea in the brain of flavours, then we need to learn about how we develop these flavour preferences. And this is the third talk by Julie Manella from Manel, who will show us that a, the process of developing these flavour preferences starts even before we're born, but has a big impact throughout life. 
And of course, what we decide to eat has much more, is much more important than just its flavour. We care about where it comes from, about the ethics of the food, about its healthful content. And all of this information is packaged up into the culture of food and will be discussed by Lord John Krebs from Oxford. And he will unpick this web of food information that we're exposed to and help us sift out the myth and the facts. And the final talk before the break, we're going to home in on this uh, fifth taste that I told you about, umami, which is the essence of deliciousness, unless you're a panda. And this, uh, from Takeshi Kimura, from Ajinomoto, will talk to us about how umami has been overlooked largely in the West, but yet it is all around us and in very British fare as well. And you'll get a chance to sample some of this deliciousness after the break when we have uh, Chef Desuki Hayashi from Tokamete restaurant in London, who will be doing a little demonstration about uh, dashi, which is a Japanese soup stock. You all get to try a little bit. Uh, and then uh, he will also do some cooking to have after in the uh, reception, which will combine some British tastes with some Japanese tastes. Just a little warning here that there will be uh, fish in the soup stock. So if any of you have a fish allergy, please don't drink it. So each of the talks will be very brief, only 20 minutes. So please save up your questions. And then in the panel discussion at the end, uh, we'll be able to ask them all there. OK, so without further ado, I think I've said everything I need to. That's right. OK, so without further ado, can I welcome up to the stage Nick Grieber. OK, so it's a, a great pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity of presenting to you uh, a little bit of our basic research on how taste works in mice. And I hope that I won't make it too complicated. Um, at the start, I just want to say a few general words about sensation in general and taste uh, specifically. Um, and, you know, I, I, if I were to ask you what this was, Many of you would say, it's a, uh, a still life by Cezanne, or it's a painting of fruit uh, and a glass of water. But really, it's just a series of colored dots projected on a screen. And what we see here, what we perceive, is something that our brains uh, synthesize. The reality that we live in is synthesized entirely by our brains. And for someone working on the basic biology of taste, one of the difficulties in dealing with an audience is that everyone has their own perception of taste based on their own experience. Um, but really, uh, if uh, we were to take away visual input and olfaction, the fruit that I showed you in the earlier still life would really taste no different from the onions in this. So uh, this was going to be a video of a mouse uh, uh, drinking. And unfortunately, the video doesn't work. Uh, um, but taste um, evolved uh, simply to provide animals with the ability to make binary decisions about the food they're in the process of eating, uh, attraction, or aversion. Uh, and um, even though it's very important for our enjoyment of a meal and has a big influence on our food choice, um, the sense of taste is by no means a gourmet sense. In fact, uh, for humans, we distinguish just a handful of different taste qualities with the taste buds on our tongue. And as we heard earlier, there are five of these. Uh, sweet, bitter, salty, sour, and the savory taste umami. And over the last 20 years or so, in a wonderful collaboration with Charles Zucker, who's now um, at Columbia University, uh, we've identified uh, the receptors and or the receptor cells that encode these five different basic tastes. And what I want to do in the next few, few slides is just use a few examples to illustrate how these receptors account for taste detection. And then I want to, um, again, 
demonstrate uh, how the taste responses of individuals and indeed whole species are determined and tuned by these receptors. And finally, uh, to explore how these receptors um, have exposed the logic of taste coding. Okay, so I want to start with a small family of three receptor proteins, T1R1, T1R2, and T1R3, that together comprise the receptors for umami and sweet taste. So in combination, T1R1 and T1R3 form the umami receptor, and T1R2 and T1R3 form the sweet receptor. And the umami receptor, the human umami receptor, when we put it together in vitro, um, in cells, responds very selectively to glutamate. And these responses are enhanced by purine nucleotides, just like umami taste. Whereas the human sweet receptor responds to all um, taste, tastants that humans taste as sweet. Well, when we generate mice, where we've knocked out the co-receptor, T1R3, these mice, shown in the red dots at the bottom, completely lose their ability to, uh, um, or, or their uh, attraction to umami and sweet tastants. In contrast, if we knock out the sweet-specific receptor, T1R2, these mice retain perfect umami taste but have completely lost uh, sweet taste. Just like, in fact, cats. Uh, nature had done this experiment for us before. Cats uh, also don't have uh, a sweet taste receptor, just like our mice. And this explains their indifference towards sugar. Um, nature's done this experiment many times. We heard about pandas. Um, uh, dolphins are even more dramatic. But perhaps the most interesting example of all, and again, this comes from a video that doesn't work, is the hummingbird. Uh, and this was a beautiful video. The hummingbird drinks a little water and then moves down and drinks the sweet, and it was going to accompany the rest of his slide. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, 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 it's not working. Um, the, the hummingbird, of course, tastes sweet. Uh, but the whole class of birds completely lack a sweet taste receptor, just like the cats and just like the mice that we created, the sweetless mice. Um, so really, the question is, how does a hummingbird actually taste sugar? And the answer appeared in a beautiful paper um, published actually in Science. I shouldn't mention that. <laughs> um, uh, by uh, uh, Maud Baldwin, who is a, a postgraduate in Steve Leavless's lab. And what she discovered was that the umami receptor of the hummingbird has just a few mutations in it that convert it from being an umami receptor as it would be, oh, oh this does work, sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I'm stupid. Um, uh, an umami receptor as it is in the closely related SWIFT, it becomes a sweet taste receptor responding to uh, sugars in the hummingbird. Uh, really incredible uh, how uh, these receptors uh, mirror the dietary choices of the, uh, these different animals. And I think this goes back to another thing that Michelle said, that there are recently more and more reports of taste receptors being found all over the place um, and being involved in things from uh, controlling uh, airway dilation to blood sugar to even fertilization of eggs. And I think that one has to take into consideration the fact that these receptors are modified always according to the diet of the animal, um, and so probably don't have such a fundamental role in these important biological processes. Okay, so the receptors also provided us clues as to how uh, um, taste is encoded. And really, uh, the first clue was that the receptors for the distinct taste qualities are expressed in non-overlapping subsets of taste receptor cells. So this 
would mean that the brain just needs to read which of the cells are being activated to know what the tongue's tasting. Um, so in other words, the taste re receptor cells act as switches, and something that activates a bitter cell generates a bitter message to the brain. And we again took advantage of the fact that there are species differences um, between mice and humans. So mice um, are incapable of tasting this compound, which is bitter to humans, and acts through a specific uh, human bitter taste receptor. But when we take this receptor and now make transgenic mice and express this receptor in the, bitter taste, in the, in the mouse's bitter taste receptor cells, the, mouse, the mice, just as expected, uh, respond as, um, as if this compound is bitter. Importantly, when we take the same receptor and now express it in sweet taste receptor cells, the mice show amazing attraction to this uh, the tastant that's bitter to humans. Mm -hmm. So this really shows that there's nothing bitter about this tastant. There's nothing bitter even about the receptor. What makes a tastant bitter or sweet are the cells which it activates on the tongue. So, okay, um, we've talked a little bit about how taste coding works. Um, how is this uh, then interpreted by the brain? And I have to say that taste detection, like other types of sensory detection, are really quite complicated. Uh, the message goes from the taste bud through taste ganglia to the brain stem and ultimately uh, to the uh, taste cortex, the insula, where um, perception is believed to really take place. Um, why, why, if taste is encoded at the level of the tongue, do we have such a complicated pathway? And I, I would say that it provides opportunities for responses um, at various levels that are, um, for example, immediate. So the immediate need to stop uh, eating something bitter, um, the gag response. These are controlled without actually knowing what you're tasting. Um, and uh, this complexity also pro provides plenty of room for modulation of taste, for example, by hunger or satiety um, and processing of taste information. Uh, but the first question, and one that is really quite controversial, uh, is uh, does uh, uh, this simple message get transmitted to the brain? And part of the reason for this is because the earliest studies on taste coding at the level of the taste ganglia came from studies of cats, long before it was known that cats couldn't taste sweet. <laughs> but recent uh, advan uh, advances in imaging technology allow us now to monitor of the responses of large numbers of taste neurons uh, simultaneously at a cellular level. And you can see that on the left-hand side of this slide. Uh, this is a taste ganglion looking through a, a, a confocal microscope um, as tastants are being flowed over the tongue. And what you can see is that there are um, very robust cellular responses. Um, what's more, uh, these responses which are shown here for individual cells, are extremely reliable, happening time after time. So this is five, five series of the taste stimulus uh, paradigm applied one after another. And moreover, the responses are selective. So this is a sweet tuned neuron responding to an artificial sweetener and to sugar. This neuron responds only to acid, and this, this one responds to two different bitter tastants. And in fact, 85% of the uh, uh, taste ganglion neurons are specifically tuned. So the brain does receive the simple message encoded at the level of the tongue. So I want to switch now to the far end of the taste pathway, to the insular cortex, where uh, Xiao Kei Chen, a postdoc in Charles Zucker's lab a few years ago, demonstrated that taste is encoded in a topographic map with sweet at the front and bitter at the back. And what I want to emphasize is that this distance is very large in a mouse. 
it's about two and a half millimeters between the bitter and sweet uh, uh, cortical field. And this allowed us um, really uh, uh, to manipulate and to trace the taste pathways independently. And I want to start with another uh, uh, technological advance, if I can. Um, um, and this is, this is a technique called optogenetics, where you can use light to selectively activate particular neural populations. And we're using this technique um, in this video, in this video that I'm going to play in a moment, to activate just the bitter taste cortex. And this is a thirsty mouse that I'm going to show you in this video, and it's being exposed to a pattern of light where the light starts off off, then goes on briefly, off, on, off, on, and so on. And what you'll see is that the mouse, it's thirsty, so it licks water at a spout. But every time the light comes on, the mouse stops licking. And so in essence, we're controlling the licking uh, remotely by just shining light to the bitter cortex. And as you can see, uh, the licks track uh, uh, the light pattern. And indeed, in experiments more, uh, uh, um, in experiments uh, uh, where the mouse is actually controlling the, the um, uh, optogenetics itself, um, you can see that uh, mice, thirsty mice, invariably uh, uh, show decreased licking in response to light to bitter cortex, and slightly less thirsty mice show increased licking in response to light to the sweet cortex. I've got five minutes, 47 seconds, <laughs> um, according to this. Uh, um, OK, uh, and this, this actually, uh, these mice that I'm showing you here actually have a knockout of a gene um, that prevents them from actually being able to detect sweet or bitter at the level of the tongue. So clearly, this cortical field activity is hardwired to trigger effective responses and doesn't require prior exposure. It's something that's automatic. Okay, so, but does the mouse actually taste bitter or sweet? And in order to ask that uh, question, we need to be able to get the mice to tell us a little bit about what they're tasting. And so we trained the mice um, in an assay that I'm going to show you on the next slide. Um, and in this assay, the mouse gets a brief uh, a cue. Uh, um, and then it has to continue licking uh, for two seconds in order to get a reward of water. If, on the other hand, it gets a different cue that we'll call a no-go cue, it has to stop licking immediately in order to avoid a mild punishment, an air puff. Uh, this video would have shown you uh, the mouse doing this, but again, <laughs> because of the way that I set it up, this doesn't work here. Um, but what you can see is that the mice are easy to train. So this mouse has been trained to go to bitter and no-go to sweet quite the opposite of its normal um, behavioral response. And you can see that it does it remarkably reliably. Now, when we use a pharmacological tool to silence the sweet cortex, you can see that the mouse now no longer uh, manages to perform the task for sweet. And once the pharmacological inhibitor has been washed out, it returns to performing the task well. So clearly, silencing a cortical field uh, prevents taste and identification. We can also use this technique combined with optogenetics then to ask, what does the light to the cortex taste? And in this example, we've trained the mouse to go to the bitter tastant and no-go to two attractive tastants, um, a sweet, an artificial sweetener and salt. And now when we pair light with the salt, you can see that the salt goes from being a no-go cue to being a go cue. So it goes from being perceived as, 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 as uh, um, something, at, uh, as, uh, as, as being salty to being something bitter. And this happens from mouse to mouse to mouse. 
Now, I told you before that taste also produces these um, immediate responses. Um, so a mouse, when given something very bitter, tries to clean its tongue and also has these large gag reflexes that cause it to open its mouth wide. And what you'll see in this next video is that when we apply strong light to the bitter cortex, we elicit these responses. And so this is, this is a mouse just being given water, and you can see that it's thirsty, it licks like crazy. When we give it water plus the normal intensity of light, it stops licking. But when we give it water and strong light, the mouse now tries to clean its tongue with its paw, and you'll see that it elicits huge gapes. Well, it would be nice to think that this mouse was doing what we do when we imagine something uh, very bitter um, that causes us uh, to, 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 to really uh, um, feel bad. Um, but that, I think, is going a bit too far. What we can really say is that uh, there's top-down control of these um, immediate taste responses by light to the insula. So I want to stop there. I want to summarize very quickly because I've got one minute left <laughs> to say that uh, uh, taste detection is, is, is therefore mediated by selectively tuned cells. Um, that this pattern of activity is, is uh, relayed to the brain unprocessed. And then what the brain does is it just uses this activity um, to drive various different types of behavior as well as recognition of quality. There are many things that we need to understand. Um, for example, how these insular responses are processed um, and how taste then uh, combines with other sensory input. Um, and we'd also like to know how taste uh, is modulated by internal state, hunger and satiety. And I want to stop there, but I want to just mention once again that this was work that was done in collaboration with Charles Zucker and his group and that many, many people have contributed to it. Okay, thanks very much.